All right, hello everybody, Steve Przbrowski here. Welcome to episode 47 of Reach for the Firefighter Badge. We're gonna continue discussing fire department oral interviews. Episode 47 is gonna discuss the opening statement that you usually get in most departments. Not every department, but most departments. So let's get going. As a reminder, my two websites, code3firetraining.com and shmofire.com have lots of great free stuff on there to help you be the best you can be. Also, these webinars are based upon two of the three books I've had published, The Future Firefighters Preparation Guide, as well as Reach for the Firefighter Badge, both available off the website. So, what is the opening statement, simply said? And that's what I call it. I don't know if other people call it that way. But what's the opening statement? It's usually that first question that not every department, but most departments ask you. So, let's talk about the opening statement. It's meant to be an icebreaker because it's asking you about you, pretty much. It's an icebreaker to sort of set you at ease because, again, Virtually every oral board should want you to succeed. Our goal is to not interview hundreds of people and get nobody to hire. The goal is to interview lots of people and hopefully find the best of the best if that's possible. So again, we, and we're not here to stress you out. So don't think that's our goal. Maybe years ago that happened, but not today. Um, I mentioned it's not always offered. I'll share shortly how it's usually phrased, meaning the different types of opening state, statement questions. But if you've got to be quick on your feet. Meaning if that first question they ask you is not an opening statement question, like it's very common, that first question, let's say, is a hypothetical scenario about you see a firefighter drinking out of a bottle, what would you do? Odds are they're not going to ask you an opening statement at all. And I know there's a department in the Bay Area, a um, big city fire department that traditionally doesn't ask an opening statement, nor a closing statement, which we'll talk about in the next episode. They get right into the hypothetical scenarios. It's like, well, the opening statement is there to talk about me, my education, my training, my experience, my knowledge, skills, and abilities, what I have to bring to the table to your department. Why would they not want to hear that? I don't have an answer because I don't work at that department. Um, but here's the challenge. If you don't get that opening statement to talk about yourself, your resume, your application, your heart and soul, you know, your brain, how are they going to get to know about you? Well, in some departments like the one I mentioned, you're just a number. They don't want your name. They don't even want you to know your background. It's like, well, how do they know who the best firefighters? I don't know. But they're going to ask you a bunch of questions, hypothetical scenarios, and they're going to find out how you're going to handle them. So, I, 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 again, I don't work for that department, but it is common that you may not get that question. So you better be quick on your feet to get out the key points of yourself. Now, you're never gonna be getting out everything on your resume, everything on your application, everything in your heart, but you better cover the key points and you better know the key points because you may not have a chance to convey them in an opening statement. So it is there also to give them an overview of you if they ask a question. You know, I would suggest, as I've talked about in the previous episode, we can't ask you your age, so don't give us ammunition. Now you can't, excuse me, you can, you can do anything you wanna do. Don't be the person that starts out there, so T Steve, tell us about yourself, or how have you prepared yourself? Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you allowing me the time to be here today, which is okay to do, please do. I'm Steve Przbrowski. I'm a 33-year-old male, wish I was, from San Jose, married to my high school wife, no, but my high school sweetheart, and then having with five lovely, charming kids, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, we can't ask you about age, so don't give us ammunition. We can't ask you about sex, gender. We can't ask you about marital status. We can't ask you about children. And I ask candidates, because like I said, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of candidates around the country, and a lot of them always start out, they prepare, which I encourage them to do, because I tell everybody, you, if you want to be successful, rehearse your answers, especially the opening statement and the closing statement. Put something together on the computer, on pen, pen and paper, or however, so you can memorize it, work on it, and come in prepared actually, versus just, hmm, that's a good question. How have I prepared myself? Give me a couple minutes to think about that. Shit, I never thought they'd ask me that question. Seriously? But I can't, there are those people. But, but anyway, I've asked candidates, why do you say those things? And of course, the advice they got from somebody, a firefighter with best of intentions, and again, everyone's got an opinion, and you ask 100 firefighters one question, you're gonna get probably 100 different opinions. But I still hear firefighters, oh, tell them about that stuff, because then that shows you're a family person. Okay. Well, in real life, my wife and I don't have kids. Nothing wrong with that. We just chose not to have kids. So are you telling me because you have kids, you're better than me? Or let's think about this way. You say you're happily married. Well, what's the divorce rate in the United States? Over 
What's the divorce rate in public safety in general? Fire police, even higher. So what's the odds that, you know, you think about it, remember, you're gonna have two, three, four oral board members, maybe up to seven, but at least two. What's the odds that at least one of them maybe is divorced or went through a brutal divorce or is maybe just bitter about dating and I guess marriage, which we all know those people. You think they're gonna be happy to hear that, oh, I'm happily married. You know, what's the saying, misery loves company? Yeah, don't forget that. Misery does, you know, misery does love company. So again, there's better ways to say it. You can say you're a family person, but again, don't shove it down our throats. Just like I talked about, don't shove names down our throats. Don't shove that stuff down your throat because let's say all three people on your oral board are all divorced. One doesn't have kids, the other two have kids, but two of the kids are in jail. The other ones, you know, just uh, won't get out of their house. Maybe they have a poor experience with kids. I don't know. Again, it shouldn't be something that they are biased or discriminatory. It shouldn't, but you, it's hard not to sometimes. Because again, just like you're human and we want to hire humans, so are the oral board members. They're human, unfortunately, that's how it goes. So try not to give them ammunition. So what's an opening statement? I've touched on this. Usually the opening statement is sort of like these four questions here. It may be how you prepared yourself, a general question. It may be, tell us how your knowledge, skills, and abilities have prepared you, which really is the same thing. It may be, tell us how your training, education, and experience have prepared you. Again, same thing, just asked a different way. Or it may be, tell us about yourself. Now, I've known some people, and you may get some people that say, well, Steve, if you get asked the first question about tell us about yourself, it's just about you. Don't get into your resume, because you think about it, training, education, experience, or knowledge, skills, and abilities, that's from your resume. That's from your application. I mean, it is, or even number one, how you prepared yourself through training, education, experience, as well as visiting firehouses and blah, blah, blah. I've heard some people say, well, Steve, if they just ask, tell us about yourself, don't even talk about the stuff in your resume. Just talk about stuff, maybe your vision, your values, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, here's the problem I have with, with that. So that means you're banking that that next question or a subsequent question is going to ask about your training experience and background, because again, we're not hiring resumes, but we want to get to know you and we want to see what you have to bring to the table. Don't get me wrong. You got to show your passion and commitment. It doesn't hurt and your preparation, but you can't bank that you'll never get another question like that. I think of all the interviews I took and I took a lot of interviews and I've been a radar on a lot of panels. I've only seen it asked once. And I remember it was the city of Fresno. The first question was, tell us about yourself. But again, I didn't know what question two, three, four, five was. You never know. So. I took it as, okay, tell us about yourself. I went into, okay, here's about myself without saying my name, with, I mean, without saying my age and my, you know, I'm single male, blah, 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 from born and raised. I mean, I talked about certain things that legally they couldn't ask me that I didn't want to, you know, throw out there. But anyway, I also added training, education, experience. I added the key points for my resume. And it was interesting because as I started getting into that, one of the oral board raiders, who obviously had a good connection with me, and part of the reason he had a good connection with me because I had visited his firehouse. I didn't know he was on the oral board because usually if an oral board member is at a firehouse, they usually can't talk to candidates. And when I was visiting his firehouse, unbeknownst to me, I remember I was talking to his crew. He was standing off in the back because he was told, you're on the oral board, you can't talk to candidates, don't give anyone an unfair advantage. But he was back on the side just listening in. And then I'm talking, I'm connecting with the crews. For some reason, I guess he liked me because little did I know, he nextly pulls up. I didn't know he was going to be on the oral board, but again, he pulls up. I just thought he was being standoffish. He starts connecting, talking, blah, blah. We hit it off. Lo and behold, whatever, a month or two later, when I came into that oral interview, it was great to see him again. Captain so-and-so, great to see you again, sir. I mean, he saw something in me. Back to this question. I started getting into not just myself, but then I talked about the other thing. And he actually stopped me. He goes, actually, Steve, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm like, Oh, actually, hold on for a second. He, he didn't stop me right there. He let me answer the whole question. I'm confusing that with another case, but anyway, he let me literally answer the whole question. So I spent three to four minutes talking about myself as well as, as, well as the, re, you know, including stuff in my resume, not just about myself, but also my knowledge, skills, and abilities. Where he came into play is the second question was literally number three, tell us how your training education prepared you, which is usually never a number two question. It's usually the number one, and that's usually it. Well, the funny thing was we got to that question and he literally told me, well, I mean, in front of the other Raiders, he goes, well, 
you pretty much nailed it in the first question. You didn't know this was the second question, did you? No, I didn't, obviously. But he goes, you nailed it. He goes, I pretty much give me a perfect score for the first one. And you answered everything in the second question. So I don't need to even ask him. He looked at the other two captains. He goes, do you guys need me to ask question number two? Or, or did Steve cover it for you guys? And they're all like, no, he nailed it. Well, shit. Awesome. Well, again, he didn't have to do that. He obviously saw something in me. Now I got a job offer. Obviously I did well in that interview. They were gonna hire 15 paramedics. And then of course the city council at the last minute canceled their paramedic program in 95. And instead of hiring 15 paramedics, I think there was like three or five EMTs. And it was like, well, hell that sucked. But again, things were done for reasons. Great department, great people. But again, he was nice enough to throw me a bone there. Now, I mean, now he could have easily also said, all right, Steve, the next question is, tell us how your education earning is better, and made me do the whole spiel again. But again, no reason to. But, you know, you never know what the next question is going to be. So that's why I think if you get the question, tell us about yourself, you should be prepared to throw other things in there. Because what's the worst that could happen? Worst that could happen is that the oral board goes, well, okay, stop right there. That's actually the next question, which I've had happen to me too. So no need to go there. Well, are you done with the first question? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much done. Okay, perfect. Now we'll go to the next two. Now start this answer. But anyway, these are the most common opening statements. So I've talked about this and just to remind, if your opening statement about tell us yourself is less than two minutes, you're probably selling yourself short. If you're talking more than four minutes, you're boring the crap out of them unless you're an awesome communicator that can keep people engaged. Very few can keep keep people engaged. So two to four, and you may go, well, how do I know it's that long? Well, like I suggested earlier, take the time to type it out in your computer, or maybe write it out by hand, whatever it is, take a timer and start timing yourself. And then when you go, oh crap, that was like 55 seconds. It seemed like an hour, 55 seconds, you better ask some substance. Or you other side, well, that's seven and a half minutes. Cut some shit out, dude. Get it down to about three to four minutes. Well, I got all this great stuff. I know you do, but you're not that important. I mean, myself included. So you have to keep the audience engaged. You are a communicator. You think of yourself like a comedian, just please don't be a comedian and have a sense of humor, but you've got to keep the audience engaged. I can't stress enough, prepare in advance. It's going to make a major difference. And like I shared earlier, start with a blank piece of paper, if that's you, or maybe you're a word person. I mean, personally to me, I'm a computer person because I like the ability to save it because then I can always work on it. It's work in progress. So have something that you can save, not just for the opening statement, but for the closing statement that we'll talk about in the next episode, as well as every other type of question. Type out on the top. Question number one, tell us about yourself. Type in your answer. Again, I don't want you going into the interview memorizing things because you know what? There's no way any, well, there are some people, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to come into that interview memorizing a page or two of information because you're going to sound, I don't know, you're, you're going to come across as memorized. And I've seen candidates that come in, it's almost like, this is too slick. Did they know the question? I mean, it just, it comes across wrong versus being human and having your personality and being able to, even if you make a mistake or two, you're human, but you got to write out your answers in advance. You got to rehearse them because that's how you get better at things. Now, some people do good with just bullet points of what they want to cover. Some people write things out, whatever works for you and your style. How do you, how do you create your opening statement about tell us about yourself, tell us how you prepared yourself? Well, I think the key thing to do is first of all, have your completed application in front of you. So whether it's a computer you're gonna use or pad and paper or smartphone, have your completed application. If you refer back to episode 36, we talked about completing the job application. So let's say you're testing with the city of Sacramento Fire Department, print out the application to have it in front of you. Then also have your completed resume. Well, I don't have a resume, get one. Refer back to episode 35 and I touched on resumes. By this point, if you're, in, if you're at an oral interview, you should already have your, obviously, application because you had to apply to get the, at least get to this point. You may or may not have had to submit a resume, but you still need a resume. And again, the difference between an application and a resume is they tell you what goes on the application, you decide what goes on the resume. That's the nice part. And I'd also encourage you to have a completed background investigation packet. Now I mentioned in one of the previous episodes about um, background investigations, and I'll talk a little bit more in the future about background investigations, but if you go to my website, ShabotFire.com, click the free stuff link and scroll down, you'll see a free download of a Word document that's a background investigation packet, a very standard type of packet that's used 
um, that's going to ask you about the key things. Now, an application is maybe a couple pages. A background investigation is like an application times 20. The, app, the background investigation packet is like everything you've ever done, usually 15, 20, 25 pages. But to create your opening statement from scratch, it's nice to have a resume, an application, your background investigation, because that's your starting point for the, whether they ask you, um, tell us about yourself, what's your education training experience, your knowledge, skills, and ability, how you prepared yourself. This is the primary way. Also, don't forget personal characteristic traits as well, too. So another thing um, I encourage you to do is on ShabotFire.com, one of the other handouts that I'll touch on in a second is about opening statements and closing statements. You're not me. I don't want you to be me because then you'll not be yourself. But I see what I did for my opening statements and do something like that. It's, it's great to have a document that you can update as needed, move things around, time yourself on, but write this stuff out in advance. Um, besides education training experience, please don't forget to add your passion and your enthusiasm, your smile, and more importantly, your per personal characteristics. When they say, tell me about yourself or how you prepared, besides those education training experience items, I like to also share and in addition to that, here's just a couple, couple, don't get into a lot of things. Here's like maybe three key points about me that I think are of value to the department. Number one, I think I'm a very dedicated person. Here's an example. Here's why dedication is important. I'm also a very passionate person. Here's an example. Here's the reason why it's important for a firefighter with passion. And lastly, I'm also a very loyal person. Here's an example. And here's the reason why it's important for a loyal, firefighter to be loyal. So in addition to my education training experience, as well as my three personal strengths that I offer, because again, they may or may not ask you about strengths. And if you cover them decently here, maybe they'll give you a buy when it comes up if they ask you the question. Or you know what, maybe you can give them get different strengths. But anyway, I think it's nice to add a little bit of personal characteristics to well, just to show you're not, because the thing, last thing you want to do is just read off your resume, because if your opening statement is just, well, covering the education, covering the experience, I mean, I could have read that myself, but again, not every oral board has your resume. Some don't allow resumes, but even if they do, don't regurgitate the resume, the application, or the background. And as I shared, my website has a document I put together on oral interview preparation tips, the opening and closing statement. Again, you're not me, I'm not you, but maybe you'll get an idea of how to keep it to two to four minutes, and more importantly, how to keep an audience engaged. But part of it is not just what you write and say, it's how you say it how you interact with eye contact, with, you know, smile, with enthusiasm, with human nature, like, excuse me one second, I need to take a drink of water. Not, excuse me one second, may I take a drink of water? Because what do they do? Say no? Excuse me one second. All right, thank you very much. Let me continue on this subject here. So again, communication skills, you've got to learn to be an awesome communicator because that's what they're looking for. So ultimately, don't forget that fire departments don't hire resumes, they hire people. You know, and as we've discussed on time and time again, and I'll continue to drive home key points and remind key things as I'm doing right now, we're looking for people that can connect with the oral board members in some way, some form or fashion, and demonstrate they'll be a good fit for that department. You're not going to connect with every department. I had a really good friend of mine who failed our interview. I was on his interview panel and the three Raiders, I was a proctor, but I, the three Raiders failed him. And I was amazed because as you know, it's just sort of like, I mean, it wasn't a good friend. He was just an, someone I acquaintance and obviously I was just a proctor and everything else. I remember him saying afterward, chief, how did I fail that one? And I'm like, I can't give you the specifics because we can't share the information. Again, you're not, that's the problem is, whether you pass or fail, you usually don't know more than that. Usually you passed or you failed. Departments don't have the time, ability to share that information, which as much as it'd be nice to connect with people to give them, you know, training for the next time. If we do it for one, we got to do it for everybody. And we also open ourselves up for lawsuits if we say certain things. So, you know, all I told, told this person, you know, was like, hey, you know what? I wasn't a raider. The three raiders graded you. By the time I got back in the room, they had already graded you and... All I do as a proctor is like, okay, your score, your score, your score. And I enter the scores in the Excel spreadsheet and we move on. As long as the scores are all very similar and they were very similar. He's like, well, how did I fail? I, go, I, I, I can't tell you. I go, all I can tell you though is think about this. You could have come into the 
you could have come into our interview, say, a day earlier or a day later with three different raters. Could have been the, still the same questions. You could have still given the same answers, but to three different raters, or maybe just two of the same raters, but one of the different raters, or one and two or whatever. I go, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I go, for some reason, you did not connect with that panel. And it's like the saying, like with football, on any given Sunday, you could win or lose. And, and it happens to people around the country is, yeah, you've got a lot on your resume. You've got a lot of experience. And for some reason, you may not connect with the panel. But again, I could go into your department's oral interview. Same question. I could have, let's say, four different oral boards with four different um, panels. So three different members here, three different members here, three different members here, three different members here. All say same day. Same questions, same answers. This panel could give me 100%, think I rock. This panel could give me 90%. This panel could give me 70. This one could fail me. And it's like, well, how the heck? Why the inconsistency? Because there's humans. And again, the oral board has certain things that they're grading you on. And we'll talk about that in a future episode. But for some reason, you didn't demonstrate to them that you were able to answer the questions. And it's hard because the oral board members, they're trying to watch you, they're trying to hear you, they're trying to listen to you, they're trying to write down key points, but it's hard because sometimes even when they're writing, it's hard to catch things, they try their best, or if they're focusing on, it's hard to remember things. So it's, don't get stressed over this stuff. I mean, we all have good and bad days and some days you're gonna have bad days and some days you're gonna have good days. I wish I had the answer, but as long as there's humans involved, you're gonna have variants. And even if there was no humans involved, there'd be variants. So there's no easy, perfect way. So as always, thank you very much for the gift of your time, my contact information, my social media footprint. Please don't hesitate to reach out if it could be of any assistance to you. So until the next time, take care, be safe, and be well, everybody.